and our first speaker this morning is Dr. Denis Xu, who is a uh, clinical immunologist with MHRP stationed at Ephraims here in Bangkok. She there leads the human primate lab. She completed her training, including a clinical immunology fellowship at the University of New South Wales, where she also obtained her PhD based on work done here in Bangkok under the leadership of our late director, Professor David Cooper. She's currently leading several uh, HIV remission studies, both in non-human primates and human volunteers, and these include a study in preparation with broadly neutralizing antibodies. This morning, we are uh, honored that she will share with us her expertise on broadly neutralizing antibodies under investigation for HIV prevention, treatment, and remission. Dr. Xu. Thank you so much, Eugene, for the kind introduction. And a thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to speak. So I still remember the first time I was at the HIVNET Symposium was in 2010 when I first started uh, at HIVNET. So uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be able to speak at this conference. Um, so today I'll be talking about broadly neutralizing antibodies or it will be shortened to BNABs in the subsequent slides. Um, I'll cover how they work, um, BNAPs in HIV prevention, treatment, as well as um, in HIV remission. So uh, broadly neutralizing anti-HIV antibodies are antibodies that are capable of neutralizing diverse strains of HIV, and it's naturally occurring. Um, they can be found in a small fraction of individuals with chronic HIV infection, and they've developed after a few years of untreated HIV infection. And all of these broadly neutralizing antibodies target the HIV envelope trimers. And in the bottom of the figure, you can see um, the, uh, the HIV omv trimer and the different areas that the broadly neutralizing antibody targets. So they're the CD4 binding site, the V1, V2 loop, um, the V3 glycan, and the AMPA region. And um, uh, I've also boxed in the antibodies that are latest in the clinical development. So uh, namely 3BNC117, 3VLC01, that covers the CD4 binding site, as well as 101074 and PGT121 that um, targets the V3 glycan. One thing I want to point out though is that the V3 glycan antibodies uh, are not very good at covering the CLF01AE strain, which is the strain that is most predominant in our region. And as you can see later on, when we want to design trials, it's actually quite difficult to access products um, if we only have um, antibodies covering only one site. So here, uh, I want to highlight the breadth and potency of these antibodies. So uh, for those not familiar with this area, the breadth is um, the percentage of virus from different strains in a panel that these antibodies can neutralize. So of course, we want a breadth that is as high as possible and, uh, and the highest potency, which is um, the concentration um, that the antibody can mediate um, the inhibition. So antibodies that are uh, furthest on the top left-hand corner are the antibody that has the best breadth and potency. And once again, I've highlighted the four antibodies that are furthest in clinical development. So how do these antibodies work? Well, firstly, as their name suggests, um, they neutralize. So they bind to the HIV envelope and stop interaction with um, the CD4 uh, on the whole cell and stop the virus binding. So that's uh, the neutralization. Apart from neutralization, though, these antibodies also mediate other effects. And these include opsonizing and clearance. Uh, so tagging these, uh, tagging the viruses and attracting our phagocytes to um, engulf the virus and get rid of the virus, as well as um, targeting virus for killing by effector cells such as NK cell, monocytes, granulocytes. And these um, effects can be uh, at both the stage of um, the virus attaching to the cell during viral entry 
as well as in the stage where virus is released uh, on budding. So, uh, so it can target um, different phases of the viral life cycle, um, both before it gets in and after the virus gets out. So firstly, I want to talk about um, BNABs in HIV prevention. So uh, this is an animal study um, done in rhesus macaques. And here it shows um, that four different BNABs, um, as you can see here, the four that are uh, uh, 101074, 3BNC117, VRC01, and VRC01LS, which is an, uh, with extended half-life. They were given prior to um, giving the animal challenges with a shiv, so him, simian human HIV uh, virus, a chimeric virus. So what I want to point out is that um, in the control, let's see if this, okay. So in the control group, you can see that um, without any BNABs, um, animals uh, will be infected after three viral challenges. And these repeated viral challenges are uh, in an attempt to make make what happens in human um, transmission because uh, people get infected with multiple repeated exposure. So, and then with VRCO1, um, it's, there's a significantly uh, increase in the number of challenges that are required uh, for the animals to get infected uh, to eight challenges. And then uh, 10, 1074 to 12 and a half, 3B11C to uh, 3BN11C to 11, sorry, to 13 um, challenges. And then finally, you can see the effect of extending the half-life of VRCO1 uh, with VRCO1 LS, that the uh, duration of protection is much longer at 14 and a half challenges. So this study shows that these broadly neutralizing antibodies can prevent HIV infection, with the animals that receive BNABs requiring more challenges to get infected, and that extending the half-life significantly uh, increase the efficacy uh, of protection. So there are actually uh, two parallel international phase 2B trials to assess the safety and efficacy of VRCO1, a um, CD4 binding site broadly neutralizing antibodies to prevent HIV infection. And these are the AMP study run by the HPTN, H HVTN networks. And the goal is that um, these broadly neutralizing antibodies will bind to the HIV envelope and prevent um, the virus from um, gaining entry to uh, the CD4 T cells. So as you can see, these are large study. Uh, the HVTN704 uh, uh, centered in the Americas, so uh, the United States, Brazil, Peru, and also involves Switzerland, uh, recruiting uh, 2,700 participants, uh, and participants will be randomized to two doses of VRCO1, 10 milligram per milligram, uh, 10 milligram per kilogram, and 30 milligram per kilogram. And then, uh, and then in parallel, a study focusing on women in sub-Saharan Africa uh, of 1,500 participants also randomized to 10 or 30 milligrams per kilograms of VRCO1. Now these participants will receive 10 infusions in total, their intravenous infusions given every eight weeks, and the study duration is 22 months. So this involves um, a lot of dedication from the study volunteers. Both studies are now fully enrolled and we anticipate completion at the end of 2020. So uh, I... A lot of um, th the audience here are implementation scientists as well as clinicians who looks after HIV-infected patients. And I'm sure there are questions that will pop into your head, which is, you know, we have already very good prevention um, therapy uh, with PrEP. Why do we need BNABs? I mean, there's a significant number of challenges that needs to be overcome. So uh, firstly, the potency in vitro, or what we see in cell lines, as well as in monkeys, uh, may not predict what happens in vivo in um, volunteers. Furthermore, um, as you can imagine, currently these antibodies are given intravenously. This will be significantly uh, very difficult to scale up um, globally. 
However, we do have experience with administering intravenous antibody um, in, in patients who have immunodeficiency subcutaneously. And that technique can potentially be applied to broadly neutralizing antibodies. Furthermore, as I mentioned before, these antibodies need to be dosed repeatedly. And of course, this is not very practical um, in a population-based setting. And there are currently many researchers working on mutations to extend half-life. So as I demonstrated to you in the monkey study, extending half-life will extend the duration of protection and also uh, delivery by factor, so adenovirus-associated factor, where um, the antibody genes are inserted and then uh, antibody can be produced in the body. And then uh, finally, I think the field is actually excitedly waiting for results from these studies because uh, it's actually very important to for us to find out what actually are uh, the correlates of protection, what protect people from being infected. And this, these studies will be very important in giving us an idea of whether broadly neutralizing can be protective um, in vivo, as well as what doses are necessary to mediate this protection. So then I'll move on to broadly neutralizing antibody in HIV treatment. So uh, I've covered this slide already. Uh, so the broadly neutralizing um, antibodies can prevent new infection. It can cleave virus. Furthermore, it can kill infected cells and uh, produce immune complexes that may enhance host immunity to the virus. So the last two um, are advantages over antiretroviral therapy. So a number of study has been done um, to look at the effect of broadly neutralizing antibody in reducing viremia in viremic individuals. And these are usually studies initially to verify that these antibodies actually have antiviral effects um, in HIV infection in vivo. So just summarizing the findings from these studies are that broadly neutralizing antibodies are generally safe and well tolerated. And um, administration of a single dose of BNAPs to viremic individuals, providing that that individual is sensitive to that, uh, or the virus in that individual is sensitive to the BNAP, there will be rapid but transient reduction in viremia. And the viral load often return um, due to two scenarios. Firstly, when the broadly neutralizing antibody concentration decreases. And secondly, when there is emergence of resistance. And of course, uh, learning from our experience with antiretroviral therapy, broadly neutralizing antibodies used in combination show greater efficacy. So here you can see data from seven viremic individuals. And I want to point out that these individuals are pre-screened uh, for sensitivity to both antibodies. And um, four of them receive a single dose and three of them receive uh, three lots of two weekly dosing. So firstly, one I want to point out is the reduction in viral load. So you can see that the viral load reduction is more when antibodies are used in combination compared to um, as monotherapy. And, and this, of course, is not surprising uh, because the virus readily uh, mutates and become resistant. However, what I want to point out is that predicting sensitivity is actually quite a challenge. Now, I want to point out three patterns here. Uh, we don't need to look at each graph in detail, but I just want to get across three different patterns of response. So the first pattern is what I've highlighted in green. Um, in black is the viral load, and then in red and blue are the levels of the two broadly neutralizing antibodies. So the first pattern I want to demonstrate is that uh, after administration of the BNAP, there is a reduction in viral load, uh, which is transient. And afterwards, when the antibody levels get low, the virus rebounds. And you can see this pattern in these four patients, where there's an, a reduction that is transient, and when antibody levels reduces, the virus rebound. Then there is 
uh, a second pattern, which is uh, the participants having pre-existing resistance. Now, so, so bear in mind that these participants are already screened uh, before study entry for sensitivity. However, um, there are a small population of viruses that are resistant that will emerge um, when, uh, uh, during administration of these antibodies. So here you can see this participant has a pre-existing resistance to 3BNC117, so one of the two, also for this participant. So you can see an initial reduction still. Uh, that is uh, a, a, of much smaller duration because practically what are happening to these participants is that they're being exposed to monotherapy. And so then they rapidly develop resistance and virus rebound occur before the antibody um, uh, dissipates. Then lastly, there's this participant, and you can see that the viral load didn't budge at all. Um, and this is because this participant actually has pre-existing resistance to both BNAPs. So, um, and that is uh, why there's no viral load reduction. Uh, next, I'm going to um, present to you what we're doing with BNAPs in HIV remission. So, uh, Tony actually uh, outlined this very nicely in his talk on Monday. So, HIV persists in blood and tissues uh, as latently infected cells. And latently infected cells are cells that harbor the HIV DNA, which is integrated into the host DNA. They're hidden from the immune system because, uh, by definition, they're not actively transcribing. So no viral proteins are being produced, and thus these cells are not detectable by the immune system as infected as such. However, they can later on become activated and produce infectious virions. And despite long-term ART as well as plasma viral suppression to undetectable levels for years, when we stop antiretroviral therapy, viral rebound occurs in most of the participants. And this is exactly because of our reactivation of viruses in the latent reservoir, leading to virion production um, when ART is lifted. So there's a lot of interest in looking at the use of BNAPs to um, target um, the latent reservoir or use it in HIV remission. So here uh, I'm showing you three studies that have been done um, uh, by the ACTG as well as by the NIH, um, as well as the, uh, the Rockefeller Group, and also um, at SEARCH as well. And all these antibodies look at the question of can BNAPs target the virus that are emerging from the latent reservoir? So after you stop antiretroviral therapy, when the virus is coming back, whether the antibodies or the BNAPs have activity against the virus that are coming out from hiding. So that's the prime question. Uh, so I will share with you more detail using the SEARCH study as an example. So the SEARCH study um, is done at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. It's led um, uh, by Dr. Jintanet and Warrenich with um, Dr. Trevor Kroll at MHLP and of course uh, Dr. Don Colby uh, locally um, at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. And so in this study, participants with acute HIV infection, um, they were started on antiretroviral therapy at the diagnosis of acute HIV infection and they had viral suppression uh, at the time of entry into the study. And so after study entry, ART, which is the blue, uh, is lifted. And then at the same time, they are randomized to receive either VLCO1, administer three weekly intravenously, or placebo. And then uh, we wait for virus to come back. And then uh, participants are reinitiated on antiretroviral therapy uh, when a viral load is uh, over 1,000 copies per mil. So here you can see this is uh, the time it takes for uh, plasma HIV RNA to become over 1,000. You can see that the medium time in the placebo group was 14 days. 
And the median time to the FRCO1 group is significantly longer at 33 days. So the results are significant, so it does indicate a signal, but um, it's modest. Now, similar study, uh, similar findings uh, were also uh, found in the other studies um, that I showed before. So uh, a number of these uh, BNABs uh, in, uh, during ATI study or analytical treatment interruption study show that some participants do exhibit a delay in time to rebound and it's usually in the order of weeks. However, it was clear that BNAP's monotherapy uh, was unable to maintain viral suppression. Uh, some studies also found a selection of pre-existing and emerging resistant virus. We did not see this in our cohort, but um, this has certainly uh, been evident uh, in the NIH and the ACTG study as well as the Rockefeller study. So once again, not surprisingly, even in remission, broadly neutralizing antibodies in combination show greater efficacy. So here, um, this is a study where 11 individuals on ART for 24 months with suppressed viral load uh, also pre-screened for sensitivity to both uh, of the BNABs, and they were given three infusion of both BNABs at three weekly interval. And so, firstly, you can see the data for all participants, all 11 participants, and you can see that um, there's a significant delay to time to rebound, uh, 2.3 weeks compared to historical control, uh, uh, six weeks in participants with monotherapy with 3BNC117, and a much more delayed rebound at 21 weeks in participants who received the combination therapy. And then when you look at participants with sensitive versus resistant reservoir, you can see that the two participants with resistant reservoir rebounded very quickly. Whereas in participants with sensitive reservoir, um, the rebound is significantly slower and very extended. And uh, furthermore, two participants actually did not experience rebound um, at the end of the study. So, this is a very nice proof of concept study and provides very exciting data that combination BNABs is sufficient to maintain viral suppression, providing that these individuals are sensitive to the antibodies, or the, sorry, the viruses in these individuals are sensitive to the antibodies. And also when the concentration of these antibodies remains high or remains um, therapeutic. So rebound occurs uh, in sensitive individuals when antibody levels drop beneath 10 milligrams per mil in the serum. So uh, you can see from both um, treatment uh, as well as uh, remission that predicting resistance is very difficult, and this is because um, the assays at the moment uh, are based on outgrowth uh, in the pre-screening, and then it actually only picks up population of viruses that emerge very quickly uh, uh, in vitro, and these viruses may not um, represent the minor variants that we see in vivo when ART is lifted. And so finally, um, uh, the studies before um, showed you what happens when BNAPs are used against viruses that are emerging from the latent reservoir. So, so once they emerge, they're no longer latent. So I just point, want to point out an animal study that actually shows that these antibodies can, may also be able to target latently infected cells. So these are animals are also uh, infected with a SHIV, so a human, simian human immunodeficiency virus. And then they started on antiretroviral therapy very early, at week one post-infection. And they're given a toll-like seven receptor agonist, GS9620, which um, is an attempt to activate um, HIV transcription. Or and then um, the BNAPs, or the combination of um, the TLR7 agonist and the BNAP PGT121. And what I want to show you that is that in the animals that are given the combination therapy, which is the 
um, TLR7 agonists activating the immune uh, responses together with the BNAPs that a number of animals, five out of 11 animals, actually did not experience viral rebound. And this is very significant results because it shows that um, whilst these animals are still on antiretroviral therapy, the administration of the TLR7 agonists uh, and the BNAPs can actually target cells that are latently infected. So given these um, preliminary results, there are actually a large number of BNAP studies planned in the pipeline. And I've highlighted um, a number of these studies. And in the red boxes, you can see our studies that involve um, ATI, or analytic treatment interruption. Analytic treatment interruption is used because we actually don't have a very good measure of the viral reservoir or, let, or the latent reservoir. And so we often um, interrupt therapy and wait for virus to rebound to look at how much efficacy we have on the latent reservoir. And of course, the performing of analytical treatment interruption study is not without risk. So um, in participants with very early acute HIV infection, some of them are actually seronegative. And then, when ex and then during the course of ATI, they can seroconvert. And this has significant um, psychological as well as social implication to the participants. So the participants need to be aware of these risks prior to joining. Furthermore, as you can imagine, during the time of viral rebound, participants can also transmit the virus to their um, sexual partners. So this is also one of the key areas that we stress to our participants, that they have to use barrier contraception, and we also offer PrEP to their partners. So you can see that these um, ATI studies are not uh, without risk, and it um, needs uh, a lot of dedication from the participants to conduct. But a number of these are being planned to evaluate the efficacy of BNAPs uh, in HIV remission. So in summary, um, BNAPs holds potential for HIV prevention and treatment, and it's currently being evaluated in a number of phase one and two studies. And there are a number of major hurdles to overcome. Um, in terms of treatment and remission, the uh, pre-existing uh, uh, in vivo sense, uh, being able to predict resistance, it's important. And uh, accurately predicting potency is also important. And we also need to optimize delivery as well as uh, dosing to reduce the dosing intervals. And I just want to point out that advances are actually impossible without the willingness and the dedication of the participants. So in blue boxes are comments from the participant on the AMP study, the antibody-mediated prevention study. And in green are the participants from the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center. And you can see the huge amount of altruism um, of these volunteers. So uh, the first box, I won't read all of this, but uh, I choose to volunteer as a way to continue to serve my, uh, to continue my service to the community. And I believe that it is especially important since gay black men like myself are greatly affected by HIV. Uh, also like this one, uh, through the last 10 years, I've been around several HIV positive individuals and have always wanted to have the opportunity to do more to help them. And then within our own, um, at the Thai Red Cross AIDS Research Center, I'm infected with HIV and if there's research that allows other people to get benefits from my HIV status, I think it's okay. Every trial has a risk, but if I can accept the risk and be get benefits to myself or others, then we should try. And this is a response um, in a participant who was zero negative and became zero positive when his virus rebounded. His response was, um, I was shocked. I did not know what I should do. I walked around like I lost my mind for a whole day, but now I am okay. And this is another participant. If you can take a risk and accept it, you should give it a try. At least there will be a benefit to the research team. If it's successful, others will get benefits from our devotion. So, you know, we, it's not possible for us to carry the science forward without these dedicated individuals who are giving up their time, their efforts in joining these studies. 
And finally, I just want to uh, acknowledge um, my mentors, uh, Dr. Sandy Fasan and Jintanet and Warnage. Uh, Sandy and Eugene provided me with a lot of comments for my slide deck. And the large number of individuals involved in the study um, in the Thai Red Cross, which I, uh, the study that I presented in greater detail. Thank you for your attention.